Um, my name is Kat Buxton. Um, I am founder of the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition. And I wear a few hats, um, but tonight I'm the facilitator hat with, yeah. yes, and this one is Wool, which is also the name of my band. <laughs> Um, but so tonight, I'm so pleased that you're all here for the Soil Series, Grassroots for the Climate Emergency. We've been putting a lot of effort into making sure that you know about it um, and to putting together some really good programs. So uh, I'm going to um, let you know about the raffle. I'm assuming everyone heard about it when you came in the door, but just in case you didn't, everyone who is here gets a free raffle ticket if you want one. The prize is six books from our three featured Vermont women authors who are also uh, speaking at these series. Um, th those books are also for sale, but on April 24th, we're going to do a drawing. One person gets six books. You can also buy extra tickets if you want to, and all the money raised is going to help us to pay for this event. And Chris, who runs Bail, Building a Local Economy, and I, for Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition are going to split any proceeds, should there be any, so that we can continue to do really good work. We think it's good work um, like this. So I'm going to hand it over to Chris. Hopefully and I'll be short. Yeah, um, I, I guess first I could just say our, our general idea for the format is 7 o'clock moments. We start with our three presenters. Half of the program is listening to the good information that they're bringing us in the other half of the program, we are gonna engage in a community discussion. Uh, so we really wanna hear from you as well. That's the point of this series designed by Chris. Like in general, right? And Kat. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm Chris Wood. I'm from Bale, building a local economy. Um, and for those who don't know what Bale is, it's a community resource center for local economy initiatives in, in the White River Valley. So we are focused on the watershed. We are multi-issue in the, what we uh, do for topics. And we are um, uh, multi-disciplinary um, in the way we do programming. This right here is actually your part. You're the first of the fifth year of what we've called in Randolph. So for this, for year five, this is called Building Resilient Communities. And so every year we sort of plan, okay, what's, you know, what's the series we're going to do? And we do sit, actually, back five years ago, it was called Why Build a Local Economy Series. But anyway, you know, it's, it's still the same thing. And we did a lot more programs back then. But this year, um, I sort of I decided to approach Kat and said, well, "This is the topic. This is what we have to be talking about." And pretty much, I didn't have to do anything after that. This is really <laughs> this is really <laughs> Kat's thing, <laughs> which I like. I like. I like that. Um, so anyway, this so this is you know this this is really sort of in some ways you know I, I think of what Bale does uh, and how I just start describing it now is and this five years ago this is what I, I would have never said this but here we are five years later climate chaos and disaster coming you know closer and closer in our face. Um, so what I say about Bale is it's um, about consciousness raising, culture shift, and backyard skills building. Um, so the Soil Series is all of that. So anyway, I'm grateful for that. I, I, now I have to make sure I do my little duties. Um, surveys, we would love it if at the end we have surveys back there. Just give us feedback. We want feedback. Um, it'll help us for the future programs. Um, sign up sheets, of course, for a Healthy Soils Coalition and Bale. Um, I just uh, nod to Orca Media, who's here. That's going to be who's going to be uh, doing the entire series. Big nod, of course, to the 
invisible people over there, which is the Black Crim Tavern. Um, so that food is from the Black Crim, and that'll be there. Different things will be there every every time you come here. Kat already mentioned the raffle, so they cross that one off. And then I want to give a brief moment to Lauren to stand up and give a 15-second pitch. Yes, um, quick shot in the dark, shameless plug. If there are any, if anybody in the crowd has started a farm in the past few years or is looking to, my name is Lauren Griswold. I work at Vital Communities, a nonprofit in micro production, and I'm organizing a short meetup series for new or newish farmers in this area. I'll be around after. Come snag me. Thanks, Lauren, from Vital Communities. So in case you didn't hear that, check in with Lauren if you are a new farmer. Yes. Good stuff happening with Vital Communities is putting together. Um, so I'd like to introduce our speakers. Um, they're going to help to frame this first discussion, ground to body, soil health and human health. Our whole series is, of course, about soil, and we're trying to approach this from different areas because soil is literally the foundation that we all stand on uh, and we're going to get to hear how a lot of our Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition members and community members feel about that. So we have Dee Dee Pursehouse who's going to be our first speaker tonight. We have Grace Groshini, Groshini who is going to go <laughs> like Looney <laughs> uh, and Michael Den Denmi. So Grace Groshini is going to go last, Michael is going to be second and Dee Dee is first. And I hope you all had a chance to read their bios. These are three really interesting people in here. Let's get started with Dee Dee. You know, in the old days, when I got started long ago, like five years ago, <laughs> um, um, uh, there, there, weren't, there weren't so many people coming out for, for soil talks. Um, but I think the word has gotten out that this is a really, really, really key piece to community resilience, to public health, to climate change, etc. cetera. So, um, so I'm going to try to kind of start things off with a bang to give you the 12-minute the version of why soil is important in terms of um, all of the above. Uh, and I'm going to do, so, so uh, I, I, many of you knew me in my previous incarnation as an acupuncturist in Thetford, which I did for 25 years, and, and was spent the last nine of those writing a book called The Ecology of Care. And in the writing of that book uh, led me into soil, and I realized soil was a way to impact public health much more uh, on a bigger scale and more dramatically uh, than, than keeping treating patients one-on-one. -on -one. And for those of you who are still treating patients one-on-one, -on -one, please keep going because I feel a little badly having stepped out. So <laughs> um, uh, all important work. So. Uh, I wanted to just show a couple of slides. Uh, the first thing that I did when I transitioned was to, to, to start writing curriculum because I wanted to, I know that I learn better when I'm teaching. So I tried to, whatever I learned, turn around and teach it to someone else and then keep track of that learning and turn it into this, which is a free downloadable curriculum at soilcarboncoalition.org slash learn. Um, and while I was writing that, there was a, a day on July 1st, I was over in the Adirondacks and I got a call from uh, from someone in the family saying, uh, there's some stuff going down here in Thetford. Yes. <laughs> and this this is the road behind our house, um, Buzzle Bridge Road, some of you may know it. It's a great road, walk down to the river. Well, when I came back, it looked like that. So, <laughs> um, and it still hasn't been fixed. And that's a lot of money to fix for a town of 2,000 people, most of whom are only this tall. So, um, so when we think about the economics of like how much money goes towards health care, how much money goes towards this, if we're spending money on this every time we get a few inches of rain, uh, that's a problem. So it was that interaction with Irene when we saw this kind of thing that got really got me shifting towards thinking about rain hitting the ground and what happens. So, my lovely trusty boss 
<laughs> an assistant. <laughs> um, Kat will bring over something. So this is so this is the way I came up with to explain this fast and dirty. Um, of what's the difference between healthy soil and unhealthy soil. And I just came back from speaking in Paris where someone translated my PowerPoint into French. So, um, <laughs> so if you're wondering how to say that in French, there it is. Um, so we have a, great. so this is a plate, sorry, this room is arranged really badly for this. We could do it. Can we hold it up? Uh, Sure, why don't you hold that? Just don't hold it too high. So oh, yeah, hold it kind of down low. So this is just a plate of flour. You can imagine this too. Anyone who's done any baking knows what's going on. Case itself. What's that? Music standing. All oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so flour right here is going to be a stand-in for sand, silt, and clay, which is essentially broken down rocks that is a substrate of soil, of all soils. And, um, if we were outside, uh, I might have my whole blow on that. <laughs> um, and, and we would get the dust bowl, okay? So, so when sand, silt, and clay don't have anything holding them in a living matrix, they're, they're basically just dust, okay? And they can move. So, so this, is, this is a stand-in for, for that mineral substrate, but it's also showing us what happens when soil is degraded, uh, when desertification happens uh, on, on dirt roads like, like we saw, right? That, that the road was missing, the forest didn't go anywhere. Okay, so the forest had biology working in it, the road didn't, that's the first clue here. So um, we're gonna hang on, oh, well, hey, we're not there yet, yeah. No, we don't need that. <laughs> okay, so I need someone to make a rain cloud. So this is a demo I encourage you to do at home, at dinner parties, turn around so they can really enjoy you making a rain cloud, okay? Okay, and then I need somebody to be God, or the goddess, or female God, or they God, or good. <laughs> of course, yeah, no, yes, who could be better? <laughs> So what do All I right. do? So, so we need to open this up. Here, the rain cloud can open that up. Or, yeah, God's going to open up the flow of water in the universe. Okay, and then stand, stand that way so everybody can see. So God is going to pour some water into the rain cloud, and we're going to see what happens to the soil. And don't go too much because what's happening? So anyone who's made bread, you know, when you pour the liquid on the flour, what happens? Yeah. Yep. How about you can you can so you don't need to keep pouring. That's good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, good. Cool. Yeah. So why don't you just walk down there, Michael, and let people see what's happening? If this was a landscape, what what has happened? Runoff. Runoff. Yep. Yep. So the water's moving sideways over the top. It's not going in. What else? Erosion. Erosion. Yeah. Mudslides, maybe if it's a big erosion. And there's a flood, right? So that water has, has to go somewhere. So suddenly you have a flood. And it's is that underneath. It, yeah, the water's not clean. So it's taken the soil with it. It's taken any chemicals that were in there. It's taken manure, if it's that kind of farm. So um, if there's antibiotic resistant bacteria and it's a feedlot, it's taken that and it's washed it all around. Um, and, if, and, if, and that's also getting blown into the air when the wind comes along. Okay, so, um, and did the plant roots get any of that water? Nope. No, because if you dig down under there, it's completely dry. So what do you have to add to flour, the one thing besides liquid, to turn it into bread? Yeast, Yeast which is biology, a microorganism, right? So same basic, uh, it's not, not, it doesn't happen in the same way, but the structural difference between flour and bread is exactly like the structural difference between unhealthy, abiotic soil that has no biology in it and biologically active living soil, which I call the soil carbon sponge or the soil sponge. 
And why is it a sponge? Well, we're going to see. Yeah, you know what I'm going to do here? I'm going to... Put it on the How about that? For those people who can't quite see, there we go. <coughs> okay, so we're going to rain on this landscape. And you can imagine this. What's, what's happening? Also, feel free to get up and come right up front. There's plenty of room all the way around. What's different? It's absorbing the water. It's absorbing the water, yeah. What else is it doing? Or what is it not doing? Not running off. It's not running off. It's going in. Filtering. It's filtering it. Yeah, it's filtering it physically, and it's filtering it biologically. So it's capturing it in those pore spaces, but it's also filtering it because the biology is going to break down those chemicals into their original parts. Okay. Now, if you keep pouring, we can usually pour about ten times as much water on this landscape as this one, and. Um, Eventually, what's going to happen is it's going to start coming out the bottom. So in a landscape, what is happening there? It's the roots are down there, right. What else? The aquifer, yep, the water table. So we're refilling that, the water table with clean, clear water. And if you put these two plates out into the sun, what's going to happen to each one of them? Let's say we're in, you know, Africa or something. The, the water in the flower one is going to evaporate really fast. It's going to evaporate super fast. Yep, absolutely. And make it's also going to make a cross and kind of seal off. So then the next time it rains, even less rain can get in. And and this can happen even on like a nice organic farm around here. You can see, uh, I've seen this, where you come right after a rain and it looks just like flour. There is like a gooey, sticky layer on top and as the heat comes down in the hot day, that seals it off. Okay, so if you lived somewhere where there was a lot of rain, like Vermont, uh, which landscape would you rather have around your house or, or on your farm? The bread. The bread, yeah. And how much if you live somewhere that just got a little bit of rain, like like really, really, really just a few millimeters of rain and you were trying to grow food. Bread. Still the bread, yeah. How about if you live somewhere with really high winds? Oklahoma, the Plains, the or Vermont <laughs> last week. <laughs> the bread, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so so how does how does that happen? How do, what is what's going on here? What what we have is we have porosity, right? A sponge, it's a sponge because it's porous, right? So there's holes there. But the other thing about a sponge is when you put it into water, it doesn't fall apart, okay? So, it's, so a sponge has two really important qualities to it, and a living soil sponge has both of those qualities as well. The life that has moved through there, so we have plant roots going down, feeding soil biology, those root hairs and the fungal hyphae start working to tie all those little particles together. And then all the slimes and glues of life stick those particles together. And as things stick together around them, there's space. And that space then also leaves some room for more things to move through there. You start to get some earthworms and you get other little smaller soil biology moving through. You get bigger things when they do moles and foxes and other things. So if you have a real drought, those bigger holes kickstart things when it rains. So important to have all different size holes. So um, I don't know where we're at time-wise. Probably getting close. We got, we got like two minutes. Oh, all right. Wow. What's this is like? <laughs> OK. So let's look at what this looks like um, up close. And actually, let me just show this one first because that's what I was talking about, those biotic glues, those slimes and glues of life. So that soil one on the, on the right is, that's like the bread, okay? You can see that you can put it in there, you can leave that for 24 hours, 48 hours, the water's still gonna be clean because all those mineral particles are held together. They're not falling apart. And the one on the left is like the flower. As soon as it gets in the water, the, the water whoosh, like that. Okay, so 
Here's a rainfall simulator. These are five, same soil type. So for your soil geeks out there, it's not that one of them is sand and the other one's all clay or something. These are the same, same ratio of sand, silt, and clay. But what's different is the way that they've been managed. So, um, so this one is conventional agriculture, lots of heavy tillage, no cover crops, not a lot of biology going on there. And we put four inches of rain on three inches of soil. This is like a big cookie cutter. And what's happened is that nothing has come through. There's no infiltration. It's all run off and it's taken a lot of the soil with it. So in Iowa, when you grow, for every <coughs> bushel of corn that's harvested, we lose a bushel of soil. For every bushel of soybeans that's harvested, we lose over two bushels of soil. That is not a sustainable system and it's certainly not a regenerative system. Okay, so then we start adding in some of these soil health principles of how you grow a healthy sponge. We start adding in cover crops. We get a little bit of infiltration, a little less runoff. The water's a little cleaner. We add in mixed species cover crops and some no-till. We're going over, I don't remember exactly which one of these is which thing, but we're adding these principles of soil health. Finally, we get all the way over here. We've got, we've got uh, diversity, so lots of different plants growing. We've got perennial plants, so their roots are in the ground all year round. There's green growing stuff feeding that soil biology. And we've got animals in the system helping to manage the system. And what have we got? We've got all the water, all four inches of rain has soaked in, no runoff, and it's been filtered. So, um, so this is pretty exciting because what are we worried about? First of all, first of all, in order to in order for us to even survive, we need clean water, right? And we need and we need, we need oxygen. So plants in that system are providing us with both of those. The uh, but but what do we need to thrive? We need nutrient dense food. We also need safety from this kind of survival and thriving. Safety from extreme weather events, right? We need a livable climate. So we've got we've got clean water. We've got clean air because that soil isn't blowing in the air, right? We've got this whole filtration system. We also have protection from flooding. We have protection from drought. We have refilled the water table so the soils aren't collapsing, like in California and Florida. Anyone heard of subsidence? Where the, the land just collapses, a whole house will fall down 30 feet into the ground because there's no water table holding things up anymore. No, the aquifers are empty. Uh, we have, uh, we also have, which we'll be talking about more in a later one, that the plants are transpiring and that is taking heat away from the surface and it's cooling that the, the area and uh, a, co a colleague of mine Walter Yena says that with five if we increased the amount of green growth on land by five percent that just the transpiration alone would reverse global warming at, like as soon as we had that like we don't have to wait down the road Okay, but we're also putting carbon into the soil. All of that life is the living, the dead, the very dead. 50% of the dry weight of all of that stuff is carbon. So we're also addressing the atmospheric CO2. So there's a French initiative, four per thousand. If we can increase four parts per thousand soil carbon, we can also address climate change in a longer sense. But we've addressed the, the resilience right away, right? So we've addressed the flooding, the drought, what else are we worried about? Ocean rise. Michael Kravchik from Slovakia says if that a lot of what we're seeing of ocean rise already is because the because the plate is full, right? That all that water is leaving and going right into the river that empties, empties into the ocean. So we we're missing that soil sponge, but we can totally rebuild it. Anything else we're worried about? Toxic biocides. Yeah. So when we when we grow food in the system, there's a 
upon more nutrients because all of the because the all of that increased surface area that's in the bread, then all of, and there's so much more biology to go get nutrients for the plants and in the right ratios. The soil is filtering the water, right? The soil is filtering the water, right? So we got so we got more water, and we've got more clean water, and we're and and to do it um, optimally, we are using way less or no additional chemicals. Like Mother Nature knows how to do this. That's why that picture, a few slides back, right? That's why the road washed away, but the forest didn't wash away. Even where there were just ferns on the side, the soil stayed in place. So Mother Nature knows how to build a sponge, and we just have to follow her lead. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> thanks a lot, Dee Dee. I, I wonder, can we just have a quick show of hands of people in this room that have taken Dee Dee's soil health course? Woohoo! So I, I, yeah, I teach, a, I teach an online live course um, called, uh, what do we call it? Uh, this Growing, oh. Growing the soil sponge. <laughs> Growing the soil sponge for flood, drought, and wildfire resilience. Just, oh, just, just so you all know, I want to encourage you to yeah. take notes, too, to, about things you're interested in. But I'm taking notes, and I have folks in the audience helping. If you give me your email address, I will send you all of our notes and resources, including things like links to Dee Dee's class and, and a lot of the things the other speakers are going to provide for us as well. Michael. Are you using a PowerPoint? I am. Okay. I think it's downloaded right now. Okay. I'd like to first apologize. I think there was some false advertising. How many people saw the flyer with our pictures? That that one of me, that was a younger me, that was the wrong guy. Presenter <laughs> real. Um, All right. And then you'll switch it with the little arrow. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, just to let you know a little bit of, about um, my approach uh, to soil, I take it from not only an environmental stance, but also from a social activism stance um, and a peace approach, because I think they're all explicitly linked. Um, and I, I've worked on some reservations out in the Southwest um, and also up in Canada with First Nations people. Um, and we gave them the worst land. We gave them the most depleted land. Um, and then we only wanted to take it back when we found there was some minerals and oil and gas on those lands. Um, and, they, and the sad thing is that they lost some of their ways of being with the land. Um, and some of the elders I was fortunate to spend time with talk about that. The same is true in West Africa, because I have a seed program out there in Gambia, teaching them how to f uh, grow food again. Um, and we're working with an NGO out there called African Organics, teaching permaculture and organic gardening. Because um, they don't, the people forgot how to, to survive, how to live. And, and much like Native Americans here, the Native people of, of West Africa are also suffering because of you know, colonialism, post-colonialism, we talk about that in this country. Anyway, I don't want to go too far on that. But that's, that's the, the web that I bring together. Um, I also work in a hospital. I work at Montescutney Hospital in Windsor, Vermont, and I'm the head of our sustainability committee. And one of the things that, in the 24 years that I've been there, is I'm always pushing the hospital to do more because we create a lot of waste. Um, and so at our little hospital, we compost on site, uh, probably 90, 95% of our food waste. Um, we are looking at ways to mitigate uh, water runoff, you know, with the soil, managing the soil better. Um, we have fruit trees on property. Um, we recycle everything. Uh, and I'm concerned about the food that we feed people. You know, anybody who knows anything about medicine, you know, Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, said, do no harm. And so any, anybody in healthcare has to take that oath. Well, Hippocrates also said, your first medicine is your food. Right, so, so I've pushed the hospital to, you know, give antibiotic-free meats uh, and chicken, and also get them to um, buy as much local. I think we're up to 27% local of our produce that we feed people. Um, and when I look at things, 
you know, I look at the food chain. Um, you know, the food web is basically a link in the ecosystem from species, you know, from insects, you know, all the way up to the, the top predators. And if you look at it, you know, food chains, um, you know, it's both terrestrial, which is deserts, grasslands, and forests, and also the aquatic food chains, which exist in our streams, ponds, lakes, and oceans. Um, and so here's, here's a food chain. And I have a question after this. Look closely at it, right? You see the, the clouds and then, you know, that rains and on the lichens grow and then the caribou eat that and the wolf eat the caribou. I want you to think about what's missing from this food chain. What's missing? All the microorganisms, soil biology. Yeah, soil, right? So that first slide wasn't that long ago where when they looked at ecosystems, we, we ignored the soil. And, you know, because of the work of a lot of people now, and, you know, Dee Dee and Grace and folks, you know, colleagues of theirs, you know, we're starting to really pay attention to how important the soil is for our health, right? And we know that, you know, it goes all the way down to, you know, all those microorganisms that we have in the soil. So there's a, there's a healthier food chain, right? A terrestrial food chain where you're looking at you know, the sun, you know, the soil, the plants, the soil nutrients. Um, you know, Didi, you said, you know, we need soil rich, uh, nutrient rich soil to have healthy food. All right, how many farmers in here? How, again, how many organic farmers or gardeners, right? We know, we know how important that is, right? Um, there's been an initiative in Maryland um, about four years ago where they started looking at the local food to local hospital initiative. And they did some research looking around the country as well. Um, and they're trying to get as much food and food education, healthy food, in hospitals. And at Mount Escutney, we had some of this stuff. We have CSAs with local CSA farmers. Um, we've had farmer markets on the property. Um, uh, lots of education around healthy food. Um, how many people are familiar with Veggie Van Gogh here in Vermont? Okay, drives around the state and delivers food. Anybody can take it, any of the vegetables. Um, it's not all organic, you know, so I wish it was more of that. Um, but, you know, again, getting, you know, healthier food to people. Um, we spent a lot of money and we, we create a big carbon footprint to move food, right? Most food that comes to hospitals comes from a distance of an average of 1,500 miles from farm to plate in a hospital. That's quite a distance versus local farms, by contrast, brings it, you know, 56 miles. And uh, we're trying to do more of that. We spend a lot of money in hospitals, 9.7 billion on food annually for food and beverages in hospitals alone. And there, it's estimated by 2040, 34% of our GDP is gonna go to feeding people and healthcare. Hospitals are supposed to be places of healing and we want to bring the best food to our patients. Again, it's, it's, I've pushed our physicians to even look at some of this stuff in our hospital. Um, you know, not only is food better tasting, but it's more nutrient rich, and I'm not gonna go into all the science about what minerals and vitamins and all that stuff, and uh, that would be a long talk. Um, but we also know that soil health is important. This study was done in 1998, right? Some time ago out in Nebraska, um, University of Nebraska, and it was to in increase the awareness and the importance of, of how organisms in our soil provides the right nutrients, minerals, vitamins, and all that stuff so we have healthy food again. You know, soil health is basically the capacity of soil to function as a vital living system. This came out of that, that um, conference within the ecosystem and land use boundaries to sustain plant animal productivity and ma maintain, as Didi talked about, and enhance water, air quality, and promote plant animal health. And uh, we're a part of the animal kingdom. Um, so they started looking at these practices a long time ago. And I, I'm glad that there's been a resurgence because without healthy soil, without good land management, you know, we're, we're gonna not have healthy air, water, and food. And there's already a ton of research. I didn't bring it with me because I pared this down. But there's a ton of research about all the toxins in our environment the carcinogens in our environment. We know we're having that issue with some of the water quality 
over near Bennington. Um, I was just out in the Midwest. They've had, they're having issues out there with water. And it, it's all this stuff, all these chemicals, you know, that is filtrating into our water. Um, the soil and its constituents on human health are through ingestion, inhalation, absorption. What's the largest organ in our body? Who knows? Skin. Skin, yeah. yes. Right? I think, I think of soil, you know, since I spent time with a lot of indigenous people, it's the skin of Makia, Mother Earth. Right? And if we don't take good care of her, what's going to happen? Right? You know, we, what happens, like I, one of the things I'm most proud of at Mount Scotney Hospital, they wanted to pave the upper parking lots where the staff parked. And I said no, and I got a lot of pushback. So I went to the medical staff, and I said, what happens if we have a patient that gets burns over half or three quarters of their body? What happens? The, bo the body can't breathe, right? It can't, it can't evaporate and, or reduce heat through evaporation when we sweat, right? So they can overheat. You can have heat stroke in a normal temperature day, right? So I said, if we pave over those parking lots, that's like a burn patient. And you know what the medical staff said? Don't pave the parking lots. <laughs> that's great. Right? So, you know, I think about, again, soil that way. You know, we need it. We need it for the trace elements, you know, so we can have both the beneficial and the toxic effects of, on our health. Um, you know, it takes out the toxic effects if we have good, healthy soil. And it also gives us the trace elements and nutrients that we need for healthy food to build bone and to build cells and to build nerve cells, right? There's all this research now about neuroreceptors. How many people take vitamins? You know, all kinds of stuff. Why? Because you're trying to keep those nerve cells healthy, those cells in our body for whatever organs that they're producing, right? So, so you know, I talk to our medical staff about this all the time, you know, because sometimes we'll see, you know, cancer patients and I'll see the doc say, you know, you're losing weight, eat whatever you want. Yeah. And then I'll say, Can I? so I'll go later, I won't say it in front of the patient, out of respect, but I'll go to the doctor and I'll show the research behind it. Because we're supposed to do evidence-based medicine, right? This is evidence-based, you know, how to take care of the soil, how to take care of the planet, you know. Um, and so that, that's my big bend on this. And again, you know, the soil is the skin of the earth, you know, and we need it to breathe. We need it to provide the right nutrients for, you know, our body, you know, for our health. And that's essential, especially, you know, as we're developing. You know, think about some of the developmental issues that we're having these days with young people. You know, I mean, autism is through the roof. Developmental disorders are through the roof, right? They're so susceptible to these environmental hazards, you know, and you know, we're right. It's this, we got to take care of the soil for our health and our well-being. And not only the other things that, you know, Dee Dee was talking about, about the environment, you know, reducing floods and, and all those other things and getting carbon out of the air. We, we know what to do. The science is pretty clear. So I just want to, I want to leave you with one last thing. Um, one of the elders I spent time with, he was a Lakota elder. His name was Grandfather Wallace Black Elk. And grandfather, in, in Lakota language, they have this phrase, aho metakue oyasin. Aho metakue oyasin means all my relations, because they believe we're related to everything, right? All, all the beings, two-leggeds, four-leggeds, mammals, creeper crawlers, stone people, plant people, winged ones, and swimmers, and the mother, right? And we've got to take good care of her. Grandfather passed in March 2004, but one of the things that he talked about in their tradition that they talked about for over 5,000 years is they tell these stories. And one of the stories that they talk about is hearing these bells, and these bells get louder. And when they feel, there's six bells, and when you hear the sixth bell, that's when things are gonna be really tough. And he would say, he liked this word, he said, we live in an auspicious time. And he, he said, that's a good word for me, <laughs> you know. And before he died in March 2004, grandfather reported hearing the fifth bell from his people. So we're in, we are in that auspicious time. So, all right. Thank you.
Thank you. Oh, thanks. I have, of course, like everybody else, way more material that that I'd love to share with you than we have time for. But I do have some of the people that I love the best whose books are there for you to look at. Um, and I will try to be as brief as possible. Some of the some of the material that I wanted to talk about has been pretty well explored by Dee Dee and Michael. So I will uh, I will just continue and elaborate a little bit on some of what they said. Um, but I I want to make a couple of comments to start. One of them is to really uh, thank the indigenous people, the Abenaki people, of whose land we are really occupying as we do go about our lives. And uh, we should remember that they have been dispossessed and ignored, and we need to lift them up as well. Um, and. I would also want to uh, mention that uh, Kat has been such a wonderful facilitator for this workshop and many others through the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition. And I just want to encourage those of you who are not uh, on the listserv or signed up for the list to put your, put your names and emails on that sheet and uh, you will have access to all of the fabulous information that is available there. Um, so um, I will just go ahead and try to um, try to fill in some of the gaps and also give you a little bit of a preview of some of what we're going to be enjoying in the in the uh, series to come as we go to this fabulous series. I, I really don't know if I can come to all of them, but I will damn well want to. Um, and, you know, I, I live in the Northeast Kingdom, so, you know, it's a little bit of a schlep for me, but it's worth it. Um, so, and I love this, this healthy soils, healthy humans. I thought it was so good. It was uh, handed out by rural Vermont uh, at the NOFA conference, and I said, I want that. So here it is. And the next, the next arrow, come on. There we go. And I just wanted to, I, I love this graphic. And so this kind of really is a holistic summary of what we're all talking about. And this is a poster from the climate, Common Ground for Climate Action, we had a, a, a seminar uh, in St. Johnsbury in November. We're going to do another one in Brattleboro in April. And unfortunately, Dee Dee won't be joining us that for that one. So Kat and I will try valiantly to, uh, to make up for that. But uh, that'll be a good one. Uh, so. I really love this. I, I wanted to have an image of what does healthy soil look like. And, uh, and this comes from a guy named Steve Diver, who's a long time soil professional consultant, former NRCS, former extension agent, brilliant character. And he's been very generous about sharing his slides with folks. So. Um, I want to give a shout out to him um, and the dreadlocks image. And the other image of what healthy soil looks like, you've heard about the importance of the root system and the rhizosphere. All of what, all of the good stuff that's happening in the soil is, uh, is really concentrated in the small area right around the roots and the roots are extensive in healthy soil and so it's all like a, a, a virtuous cycle where the roots create more 
habitat for soil life. And when they die, they become the organic matter and the microbes, etc. cetera. Uh, and we saw from Didi's presentation that when the soil is in poor condition, then the roots don't grow. And this is just another really nice graphic. I think I got this one from Kat. Um, uh, about the rhizosphere, showing how all of this works. You'll get a lot more of it in uh, the, the presentation that Kat will be giving. But just a, a, a sense of how incredibly dynamic and inter, interrelated it all is. Um, again, uh, this is this is a, another one from Steve Diver, some electron microscope uh, images of these really wonderful interactions. I think that the the fungi there are are quite amazing. So, an opportunity to really be able to determine for yourself. You have soil. How do you know if it's healthy? How do you keep track? Um, and I think uh, folks are aware of the land listener workshops that have been held. I was able to go to one at uh, Butterworks Farm at Jack Glazer's. And uh, that's one of the ways that you don't need to have expensive equipment. You don't need to have a soil lab. You can monitor your, <coughs> excuse me, your soil's health through various uh, sensory methods, through your sense of touch, through your sense of smell, through your sense of taste. And um, you know, one of my very favorite uh, inspirations these days is Leah Penniman, who was the keynote speaker at the NOFA Winter Conference a couple of weeks ago. And uh, if anybody has not heard of or seen her, uh, this is her book, Farming While Black. And she goes into a great many of the wonderful, um, all of the stuff that we're talking about here, but also honors the fact that many, many of these ideas came from her indigenous ancestors from Africa, brought over by enslaved people, uh, and the images of the, the women who would weave the, the seeds, the sacred seeds, into the hair of, into their hair and the hair of their daughters who they knew were going to be caught and and sent away who knows where, but they knew that they would somehow or other at some point be able to plant these seeds and have some way to survive. And it's such an incredible story. Um, and I wanted to actually start with that, that quote. There are several quotes that she, um, she always uses in, from Malcolm X, um, which is, that land is the basis of freedom. And to free ourselves, we must feed ourselves, right? So this is an important, important uh, understanding. This is just an, another one of those images that shows you the difference between healthy soil and not so healthy soil. The flour on the left and the bread on the right. Um, you can see what the difference is. You don't need to have a, a soil test to tell you. And this is a picture of healthy soil. This is, a, again, a Jack Lasers. And uh, this, is how we, this is how we begin to repair the soil. Um, livestock, uh, appropriate tools, and the, the, he doesn't use so much tillage equipment anymore. You know, Jack wrote the book on grain growing and um, has begun to realize that it isn't such a good idea to grow all this grain in, um, you know, until the soil and have to create uh, disturbances to the soil ecosystem. 
Uh, that's one of the key things. Um, and that is, uh, that's one of the, the things that we're all learning more about, to build the soil carbon sponge. You avoid disturbing the soil as much as possible. You bring in livestock. Um, you do it in a way that is uh, going to encourage the water cycles, encourage the growth of the, of the grass and the other diverse kinds of pasture species that, um, that are needed. And uh, the, the question of diversity is incredibly important in the soil, above the soil, in the community. Um, it all is all about diversity, biodiversity, cultural diversity, um, you name it. Uh, let's see here. There were some quotes that I wanted to use. Um, the, the question of the microbes, and I could probably talk endlessly just about that, but recently <clears throat> we uh, had an opportunity to listen to uh, <clears throat> David Montgomery. Can you pass me that water bottle there? Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. We, we had a uh, chance to listen to David Montgomery and his wife, Anna B. Clay, is that how you say it? Um, and they, uh, and I got, bought a copy of the recent book that they, uh, that they wrote together on the hidden half of nature. And I was particularly struck by some of the things that Anna said. And, and uh, to, to riff on some of Michael's stuff about food and soil being the skin of the earth, well, for Anna, soil is the guts. Um, and the rhizosphere, she, she called like the, the intestines turned inside out. And I thought that was a great metaphor because that's exactly what keeps us healthy and what keeps the soil healthy and where the greatest biological activity is. Um, she said that 40% of the health promoting compounds in our body are of bacterial origin, okay? Many of those vitamins that we take are manufactured in our gut by microbes. They aren't stuff that we necessarily get directly from the plants or the other foods that we consume. Uh, this is a very important thing. And the, the inner microbiome and the soil microbiome are so deeply interconnected. Another one of my favorite authors, uh, Dr. Daphne <coughs> Miller, uh, has written several books, one of them called Pharmacology, in which she, she actually shows some scientific evidence about the health value of contact with the soil. And, you know, for, for chasing away the winter blues, there's nothing like starting a few seeds in a, in a pot of soil. My onions just came up yesterday and I'm so thrilled. <laughs> just like <laughs> makes me feel like, oh yes, there's hope. Um, okay, how much time do I have? One minute. Uh, okay, well, the stuff about climate change, you've heard it. Um, there's agriculture is responsible for a huge imprint of the food system. The food system is about between a third and close to half of climate change as you know depending on who whose research you look at and agriculture is a is a major part of that and agricultural production is a major part of that and actually food miles aren't all that big a piece of it because for various reasons but um, the actually one of the worst offense offenders in terms of climate change greenhouse gases is 
synthetic nitrate fertilizer. It's the, one of the worst offenders in terms of water pollution, and it's one of the worst offenders also in terms of poor nutritional quality. So the sooner we get rid of it, the better. I can talk at length about the, 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 the horrible things wrought by synthetic nitrate, which was originally, of course, the, the process for manufacturing it is incredibly energy intensive and it was originally created for the purpose of making dynamite in World War I. That's really what it was for. They didn't do it because they thought that they could make fertilizer. Um, anyway, um, and another important piece of that, of course, is the water cycle. There will be some great stuff on water coming up um, later on, but uh, the 24th, thank you. And the 24th, is the 20th? The, the April 24th. April 24th, okay. Yes, yeah, that's, that's the last one. I really encourage you to listen to that. I've been learning more about uh, water lately, and um, I have there uh, this amazing book called The Fourth Phase of Water. I encourage all of you to, to look into that because it's really about how water is life, literally. Okay, um, I will kind of skip over all of this stuff about why organic farming needs to proliferate. We have about 5% of the food system but by retail sales is organically grown produce or products, manufactured products, probably primarily a lot. Um, that's organically produced. Um, that's not much after 40 years of beating our heads against that wall, but we, it needs to grow. But what even more needs to grow is that we only have about 1% of U.S. farmland is organic. Organic farming does um, have some problems once in a while, but it is definitely um, shown in repeated studies to both mitigate the impact of um, climate chaos and to contribute to building soil organic matter, which is what is the soil carbon sponge. So I will just um, end with the, the community resilience piece. Again, this is Kat's slide, and I uh, encourage you also to attend the workshop that is going to be about community resilience. I think that's an incredibly important piece of it. Um, and it is all about communities working together, sharing resources, sharing the land whenever possible. Um, this is uh, my favorite uh, quote from Leah Penniman, and this is a photograph that she, her, her sister, I believe, took this photograph at Soul Fire Farm of some youth putting their, their feet in the soil and experiencing that direct contact with the earth that is so important for our health. Um, and this, I got from the, this magazine, and, how many of you have seen Yes Magazine? This came in my mailbox yesterday, and I said, oh. <laughs> and this article with that photograph is in this issue. By connecting with soil, we heal the planet and ourselves. And I think I'll leave you with that. Um, there was another joke, but this is, uh, this is enough time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, um, yes, thank you, Chris. We're going to turn on the light. What's that? How do you guys feel about shuffling into a surf? I think that would be good. Um, I know that we have some folks in the room that are hard of hearing, even when I talk. Um, and during the 
on a farm and uh, I am very interested in what people can do to start <coughs> regenerating the soil everywhere and I know that there are things that everyone can do. Um, one particular thing that I'm very interested in is I have heard that there is a kind of of uh, composting method, which is called the Johnson Soup, and that it produces in a year something that can inoculate the soil. And I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about that because I, I realize, having seen some designs and stuff, that it's a very, very simple thing to do that practically anybody could do. But 
I, I'd like to hear more about that. I uh, volunteer as manager of a community garden in Lebanon. And um, one, it, it's an organic garden, but one thing we have stopped doing is um, composting. Because communal um, composting is sort of like communal living that <laughs> tends to, um, you know, <laughs> go to the lowest common denominator. And so some people are very, uh, you know, careful about what they put in the compost pile, and others are putting in diseased um, and we things that are weedy and seedy and so on. And so the, the composting angle, I would love to add to our garden. Um, if, if anyone has tips on how to do that with a large group of people. Simon and uh, I have been. Uh, I live in the floodplain, and um, so we've been, had this goal for a long time about switching from annuals to perennials as a means of floodproofing our land. So my question is, how do I floodproof my land? Do I need to get off it? <laughs> <laughs> Here. Okay. Um, well, uh, my name is Vincent. I visitor from China. Um, actually, I'm originally following the Mono School. My research generally focuses on biodiversity conservation, so I'm really interested about the topic today. Yeah. My name is Hi, I am Michelle. Uh, I'm directing a recent uh, established research initiative. 
Institute at Bogolowski uh, about international sustainable development. Uh, so one of our focus is about uh, how to promote sustainable agriculture in developing countries. Uh, I think a lot of the experiences that people here are talking about in Bogolowski can actually be copied uh, to a lot of regions in the world, like in African countries, as you said, Asia, and also China. Uh, and also, we study how the international trade and the investment law uh, actually influence the prospect for sustainable agriculture. Because nowadays, a lot of the internationally traded uh, agricultural commodities is actually producing a very different product today. So that's kind of like displacing both economically and politically you know, the opportunities, the business opportunities, and also the economic vitality. Of traditional agricultural and sustainable agriculture. So that's a big concern of us. But thinking about how to uh, reform the international trade system and also the rules and the, the, the policies that is governing the system um, in, in order to promote sustainable agriculture. Uh, my name is Vanessa, and I've been working on uh, keeping fossil fuels in the ground and trying to figure out how to bring this to those people, and I'm realizing I don't need to because you all are just growing so fast and I'm so excited. My name is Carl. I'm the co-founder of the Soil for Climate group, and uh, we're happy to be a co-sponsor of tonight's event. Um, for those of you who have questions about this topic and wish to follow it and um, join communities full of people who uh, know more about this than I do, I would recommend uh, the Vermont Healthy Soil email list, which many of you perhaps are on, and also joining the Soil for Climate Facebook community. We now have over 10,000 members from more than 100 countries around the world. So it's a great resource to put questions out there and crowd discuss answers. I'm Sophie, and I'm interested in starting a Soil for Mark, um, and uh, we have about a, a 10 acres that we farm, and uh, I've been using, you know, a micro tiller uh, pretty liberally for a number of years. And now we're realizing the, the role of mycorrhizae in, in, the, in the soil and recognizing that, you know, we, we really need to change the, the way that we deal with the soil. We're left with the, the problem that. Um, we need a, a couple of pieces of equipment, which are huge and expensive. Uh, seed drill and sprinkler roller. Both of those are expensive pieces of equipment, which are a real hurdle to getting into um, doing the right thing with the soil. So one, one idea would be to, to try and have a you know, local um, loaner, um, but uh, you have to get enough people that are interested in my name is Lauren, and I'm always curious to learn more about the direct correlations between soil health and health. I'm Charles. Uh, I've worked on a small, different animal farms around the country. Um, uh, I'm very interested.
started a new climate change group that everybody's welcome to in the city Chester. Um, but I specifically am also interested in trying to figure out ways to bring information like this to places like the Planning Commission, which I'm on, um, to try to reduce soil compaction and not specifically last Monday, I guess we were talking about, you know, uh, stockpiling of soil and when developing and that kind of the general practice now that is that the good thing is to keep that stockpile it to do your thing and put it back to the just you know, functional. Um, so I think that place I think it would be great to have just some great things that useful tools that would bring information like this boil it down to a two minute conversation or a sheet that you can bring to a, things like a planning commission or to a uh, uh, supervisor, but to the select board and that kind of thing. So this would be more functionally used and widely practiced rather than just such small groups. Well, it's not small, but it's, a lim it's limited. Um, and
I'm Jill, and I'm also a climate activist, and I'm here because Kat said she had an interest that I don't possess, so I'm here to find out what they are. I'm Karen. Um, I have a mini car in uh, the White River watershed that used to be a I used to have animals on it, and then the animals shit enough that everything took care of itself. And I no longer have animals, and I don't know what to do with this land. Um, also, because I have really reduced capabilities in terms of the energy I can put into it anymore. So I'm looking for ideas for perennial low maintenance ways to use my land. Uh, my name's Rick, and I'm interested in two things. One is, in getting away from tilling, um, how do you, best ways to plant, you know, without tilling. And also, um, forest soil health. Uh, are there practices that can facilitate building forest soil health? Jesse, um, I think I'm, I'm both thinking about small scale things like how to uh, build more um, like a rise of fungi in my little garden plot and then also big scale things like um, how changes can take shape on um, sort of the bigger both national and global way that we do our uh, local practices. My name's Kevin. Um, I was going to say a lot about one of the much and how do we do some of these things on a small scale? Um, and 
folks that all that. But, um, another question, I guess, is with uh, forests, and particularly low grade. You know, we have I don't know, 15 inches of junky pine forest, in addition to some good forest. But you know, what's the best thing to do with that? You know, a forester will say you should be cutting that wood to regenerate hardwood forest. Um, what's the best thing to do with that from a public perspective and from a, a soil perspective? My name is Rick. Um, I live right here in Bethel um, in a tiny house I built for myself. And I'm currently renting a spot on 40 acres of field and forest. And the landowners have recently, we discussed that we're trying to we decided we want to try to create a small affordable house community there, um, which is based upon um, anti-capitalist um, mutual aid kind of principles. So we're inviting people, and there will be a farming component there, and we're not sure how that's going to work, but we intend to have plants and animals eventually, but we're just getting started out, and we're actually looking for people. So we want to experiment. Uh, I'm Sandy, and I live in Heartland. Um, I'm in a community on a 270-acre dairy vegetable farm um, land that was heavily um, raised by sheep you know, 100 years ago. So we've recently been discussing building up the health of our soils and our sugar bush area of the farm. And, um, also, rain gardens and permaculture things we can do in the community is very s sustainably oriented, but um, there's a lot that we still can do and, and so we can just do more and all of that. So. Uh, my name is Cynthia. I live here in Randolph, but have uh, purchased some property in Bethel that we are trying to build a house on. And it's got some soil that's pretty, probably pretty poor in the sand area. We haven't really gone into all the soil analysis, but I know it's not going to need organic matter, it's going to need work, it's going to need animals. So I'm glad to get connected with the resources that you guys are going to have. Um, the question I have is, um, coming to so many things, you kind of get a sort of preaching to the converted sort of vibe, and I was wondering if any of the presenters could talk about connections that they've made, maybe in the more conventional growers, even if they're just organic or, you know, because I can't, you know, Vermont is sort of a quote-unquote agricultural state, and there are a lot of people doing conventional and, and maybe, you know, not really industrial, but small scale. I'm not sure, like, what level of awareness they have. I mean, if, if, if I'm interested in hearing, you know, how that's going how, on, on that front, because it's wonderful that all the individuals can look at the patches, but it needs to take place on larger scale, it seems to me. So, if I think about that, that'd be great. I'm Ms. Scott. I live in uh, East Orlando, and we just have a small backyard garden and um, earlier this year I was excited to learn about cutting healthy soil could reverse global warming. And uh, I do have a question. Uh, we, we just started gardening recently and we have very poor soil and we don't have any live stuff, animals so how do we improve the soil uh, just not with uh, just for the compost and maybe adding manure and just My name is Josie and I live in East Randolph and um, uh, I've been growing food organically for what, 40, 45 years, a long time and, and, um, and we've had our farm for this particular farm for 10 years with food soil. But it's just dawning on me now, you know, in this past year or so. Wait a minute, the soil. Like, it's the soil, stupid, you know. <laughs> and, and, um, and I'm very proud that we, uh, we have uh, a we have number of fields and, and, a, and a very large vegetable garden. And that we are not going to till that garden anymore. And we're, you know, we, we fixed up about halfway last year and we're poised to really uh, get out there this year. And, and at the NOVA conference, I found, um, for example, you know, instead of having, like, the principle of no bare ground, 
no beer garden ever, any time, um, is, a, is a big, big one. And um, I found out that you can, in between your rows, if you're field cropping, uh, you can put an annual red clover. And I still, I haven't bought the seed, I don't know how much it costs and so on, but, but uh, it, it, you know, it's promising. Because the, 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 the farming question is how, how do you do no bare soil? Um, you got to be growing a lot of mulch, getting your hands on a lot of mulch, and so on. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited. It looks like we might make it. <laughs> My name is Kep, and um, I'm a home gardener. And um, in the past couple of years, maybe like you, I've um, realized that the soil is a pretty incredible resource. and. Um, I'm just fascinated with the whole ecosystem that's under our feet, you know, from fungal and floral and, um, and the little predators that are in there and they're all eating each other and there's just a team of life and I'm fascinated with what I know about that. Um, I'm Lauren, I'm taking notes today, um, and I'm, I'm interested in how everything connects, so soil, like the environment, um, cultural issues, economic issues, political issues. They're all intertwined. I'm interested in kind of diving into all of them and seeing what the answer is to save the world. Great. <laughs> 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 yes. Hi, uh, my name is Nando um, uh, I just moved here from Florida. Um, I run a nonprofit and I'm interested in growing corn. Uh, I'm from Colombia and that's our state of food and I run a connect with communities um, to the whole of making process and uh, just connect to the people here and to the soil and uh, I think that's great. In the back. Uh, my name is John and I'm Joshua's husband. Uh, along with the garden we're also creating a, a perennial food bars on on degraded hillside overgrown pasture. <clears throat> so it has lots of soil challenges, so having access to these kind of resources and maybe <coughs> meeting other people in the area that are, are doing similar works to exchange ideas would, would uh, be a great thing, so that's all I got. I'm kind of coming in at the end of this, but I guess I'm getting the gist of what you're talking about. Um, so I'm Jennifer, I'm from have an issue with water and um, <clears throat> I don't our place is relatively new but it was a single like hay field and then it was like pumpkins forever so all the mono stuff anyway so <clears throat> we have diversified vegetables and the water just is so attracted to them in not a great way and it just you know there's not a whole lot we can do about it except for the town maintaining the culverts and all that kind of stuff but so we have a lot of challenges with um, kind of replenishing, like, like all the time. <laughs> what do we do with all this soil that was just like washed away multiple times? So that's like a really big challenge for us. Um, and then, you know, this winter is like, I don't even know what the spring's going to be like. We can't plant in one of our greenhouses because it's like, well, there's no point. It's probably going to flood, which is a kind of a rough situation. But so I'm just thinking like, this area has never really been as floody before or as wet and so that those these are kind of the pieces that we're putting together for our, our um, farm plan for this year is kind of a guessy game but um which is totally i mean farming is hard enough as it is you know and then we're wondering what the water content is going to be but um so our biggest question that we always are asking is to what is the, the quickest way to kind of revitalize soil that's like physically left, it's gone, you know, trying to get that back up and running. So we're doing a lot of cover cropping this year and like cutting everything by 50%. So that will be, well, it's, a, it's an experiment. Let's we'll see how that goes. Um, I stood over here because I actually, for all those people who don't know, this is Sarah Nasty oh, from, <laughs> from Black Cram. So the food you're getting and woo, woo, woo. So, so, yeah. <laughs> to pick up the food, but you know, 
you know, it's it's a wonderful example, you know, where they farm and they bring they bring their their food right to the to Black Crim and Sarah is so dedicated on getting local food into everything that they do. And so not, I always not, know, not knowing the connection, I had dinner there and it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, people don't know the Black Crim is our Premier Red Off restaurant. Very <laughs> cheap. Anyway, that's my. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Embarrass her again. <laughs>